As I said before, it's, we're really happy to see this, this large interest for our breakfast seminar. This is our fifth seminar, uh, the first for this year. It's called Cellulose Based Textile. And um, we are very happy to have two distinguished speakers here today. Um, the first one is uh, Osa Östlund. She's a senior scientist at RICE um, in a division called um, uh, Materials and Products. And um, uh, she will be the first speaker today. And right after she, uh, her presentation, she will, um, <clears throat> she will hand it over to um, uh, our invited speaker from Lansing, uh, Josef Innerloinger, uh, which is, we're very happy to, to see her and uh, we're hap happy to, to have you online. <laughs> you were supposed yeah. to come to Stockholm, but now you're online, now you're in digital, uh, in digital shape. Um, and, and you have been working for, for uh, Lensing uh, for in, in the R&D department for quite a long time, about 15 years, in, uh, which is uh, very interesting and very uh, nice for us to have you with us. And for you who don't know what Lensing is, uh, it's, an, it's a pretty large company uh, based in Austria. And um, uh, it's, it's a leading company for man-made cellulose fibers of different sorts. And, and um, uh, we will be very interesting to, interested to, to hear what you have to say, uh, Josef. So before I let you in, Osa, uh, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, we are happy to, to take any kinds of questions. And we thought it might be a good idea to, to uh, gather them all up in the chat. Uh, and then we will answer all the questions after the two presentations. Uh, so uh, don't think that we forget you. Uh, just be patient and we'll take all the questions afterwards. Uh, and then I also want to urge you not to leave the meeting right after the presentations because we have some questions for you in a, in a menti.com uh, questionnaire. So please stay put uh, so we can get some in answers from you. With that, Orsa, uh, I think I will hand it over to you yeah. to, for, for the first presentation. Thank you so much, Pia. Uh, I will start sharing. Uh -huh. Like this. And point. So, hello everyone. It's really nice to see a number of people, though I don't see all of the people, uh, which I was expecting when we started planning this seminar on cellulose based textiles. So, I will start talking here on the development and applications of textiles and what we are doing at RISE within this area. And then I will hand over to Dr. Joseph Loinger at Lansing, who will then give you the view from Lansing's side on ecological aspects of wood-based cellulose fibers. So uh, with this webinar, we want you to learn more about how uh, we are contributing to reach the two degrees goal and by uh, building a bio-based economy also within textiles and also how to increase resource efficiency. Well, so may I just ask you, uh, have you, uh, we can only see Helena Hallen's screen uh, to this point. Have you taken- Oh, sorry, I, I thought I was sharing. <laughs> sorry, okay. Uh, what have I? No, this looks- There you go, thank you. Um, so, I just had to modify my screens a bit, uh, sorry for this. Um, okay, so this is my first slide. Uh, so, what we want to contribute to uh, globally is the two degrees goal, of course. And uh, we are working on a bio-based economy and to increase resource efficiency 
uh, and recycling of materials. But then uh, digging in deeper into the topic of today with cellulosics and textiles, and the reason in the last decades we've seen an emerging in interest in uh, forest-based textile fibers. And uh, why is that so? Well, um, going globally and uh, talking, taking our analytic glasses on uh, and viewing the future, this is something that I that actually motivates me when I'm working. Um, this is a picture borrowed from the Human Development Report uh, from UN, and uh, where we actually can get the indications on how the future will look like. The Human Development Index is uh, based on both, both prosperity, education, and life expectancy. So uh, what we can see from all each bubble here represents a country and the size of the bubble is the, the population of these countries. What we actually can see is that well-being or human development here is having a relationship with the ecological footprint. And the extremes here goes to Qatar, uh, Luxembourg, and Norway has the highest uh, human development index, this dot here. Uh, all our neighbor countries or Euro Euro countries in Europe is very close to this line at very high human development, which is natural. But in order to be resource efficient, we need to be below this line. So this is 1.7 uh, global hectares per, per person, uh, which means that we uh, are using the planet Earth resources in a wise way and not over consuming the Earth. So this is then our challenge to actually go get all these countries down below below this square here uh, at the same time as we are keeping the, the human development as high as possible. Uh, so this actually motivates me uh, working towards the shift replacing fossil based materials in order to decrease the, um, uh, the footprint but also uh, working on, on uh, renewable materials and uh, using the resources more efficient. So if we are staying at business as usual, this means that we will have an increase in the global climate impact by three by 2050. And this again is why I am and, and many other people are working on the bio-based economy and also to get the increased resource efficiency. Getting into the market of um, uh, fibers then, uh, we have uh, we have, uh, we have, we see that a, um, there is a market increase on one to 2% annually uh, for a demand on, on uh, textiles. We can see here on the natural fibers uh, that includes uh, wool, for instance, that this uh, yellowish uh, area here, it's, it's difficult to increase that part. Uh, going to the black area, uh, which represents cotton, this is also very difficult to increase due to uh, aerial land and that we instead need to, to use that land for growing crops and, and uh, I mean food. 
uh, so this part is also difficult to increase. Uh, going up to the green bluish uh, turquoise area, it's actually 63% of all fibers, uh, which represents the synthetics. So polyester and nylons. Uh, and in order to limit our fossil demand, we should um, convert to a more bio-based market. Uh, and we should, we are wishing to decrease this area then and increase the solo six or having bio-based synthetics. So on the top here, uh, the red uh, area, which re represents around 6% of the total mark fiber market, we have man-made or wood-based cellulosics. So this is uh, the cellulose part of wood, which is converted into cellulose filaments. And uh, I will go deeper into the production uh, on my next slide. By, but this is actually growing at a, and has the potential to grow even more. But considering uh, resource efficiency and on this slide as well, uh, and, and to see our growing demand on fibers, we need to actually recycle our fibers as well. So uh, just how we can think here, actually synthetics, if we have pure uh, streams of synthetic waste, we can actually recycle them into synthetics again. And uh, going to this part, cotton, we can actually convert that in a second life into man-made cellulosics. And Joseph will actually talk about their product, Prefibra, uh, which is recycled um, cotton. So now I'm going into how to make man-made solo six. We have this, what I call the chart of value creation. So here we start with the sourcing of the material. This can actually be uh, all kinds of crops or, or um, uh, trees that has contained cellos which most, uh, uh, most uh, renewables does. So uh, this, can, this is normally wood in our case, but can also be cotton, which is pure cellulose. Uh, we're then going into the pulping or the craft or sulfite pulp uh, cooking. This is where you actually purify the the tree or the, your raw material into a dissolving pulp or textile pulp, uh, which can be sold further or, or converted at the same plant into the, the regenerated cellulose. But before uh, we need a very quite challenging step here, uh, which is to dissolve the cellulose. At uh, RISE, we have been developing uh, the cold alkali further, but here is also uh, viscose and lyosol, very much used processes for uh, dissolving the cellulose. But in order to dissolve it, we need to adapt the pulp or pre-treat the pulp in a good way. So this is actually a quite challenging step when you're going into the dissolution of cellulose and, and you need to have the right kind of pulp. So you can't just take any kind of cellulose and try to dissolve it. It's, it's quite demanding. And then the next step, when you have your cellulose dissolution or your, your cellulose dope, you can actually spin that into a uh, fiber. So you take this dope, which is rather syrupy, uh, and you precipitate it into some kind of uh, anti-solvent. So, so somewhere there your cellulose actually pre precipitates and it can be uh, sulfuric acid, it can be water, it can be ethanol. It's different for different uh, uh, solvents. But here you can actually shape your cellulose. So what we are doing is shaping it into a fiber, but you can also shape it into 
a um, film, uh, non-woven material, or pretty much what, what kind of structure you like. Uh, and all these steps is actually what we are doing in uh, in gram scale up to uh, kilo scale at rice to develop new new kinds of processes at the same time as we are looking at the system level uh, on simulation and calculations for process chemicals and recycling of those because that's also very costly to to keep the chemicals into the loop. Uh, what's also very important is to, to actually have a sustainable process. So life cycle assessments are in, very important in this. And also the techno-economic analysis, of course. Uh, we also at RISE have a test bed on textile fiber development. So here uh, we are um, uh, developing or, or having taking up new methods and materials uh, to, to produce fibers and yarns and also non-wovens uh, from bio-based and also synthetic raw materials. Uh, we offer our expertise uh, here and uh, we are um, also having uh, uh, a testing lab, uh, certified testing labs for textiles. Uh, and uh, we are also very happy for our collaborations with industry on this test bed. And you can find more on that on, on this link. But now going commercial on and the commercial scale. Uh, the largest quantities uh, on the market is actually viscose and lyosol. So these processes are very different. Uh, and when we're looking at, at viscose, it's an old process developed over 100 years ago. Uh, it's actually using a chemical derivatization in order to easy up the, uh, uh, the, the dissolution. So we are having one, something called a centenation here, uh, which then dissolves, this is this part of the cellulose chain, dissolves the cellulose easier. This is what we call a traditional wet spinning. So the, the fiber is formed in a, in, in a precipitated in, into the liquid. Uh, and we have it actually causes several process steps after that compared to the lyosol, uh, which is rather young compared to uh, the viscose. Uh, we don't have a derivatization step. Uh, we're using a solvent that is actually very good at dissolving the pulp or the cellulose, but the um, demand on the pulp is then much higher. So in the viscose process, the pulp is adapted in within the process. And here the pulp needs to be uh, more specified from the beginning. This is an air gap spinning. So it's, it's what we call a dry wet spinning. It's another process. It's uh, normally generating stronger fibers than the viscose fiber. What you see here on the picture is actually the cross sections of these fibers. So uh, the lyocell fiber is much smoother, uh, circular in its cross section, whereas the uh, viscose is a bit more like a flower in its cross section. But as we don't have any derivatization step, uh, the lyocell process is having relatively few process steps. Uh, the kind of drawbacks or, or uh, something to, to consider in these two processes uh, is actually from the, on the viscose process, we have the carbon disulfide, which is the centenation step. Um, this is used in the process and it's quite hazardous. Uh, 
toxic. So this needs to be recycled and kept in closed loops, which is challenging uh, because it evaporates. And, uh, but it can be done and uh, when it's done, it's very environmentally friendly process. And uh, going to the lyosol, there are also issues with the, the instability of the solvent. Um, and this, as such, demands major investments on safety for the technology. This is just an overview of these two um, uh, processes and how we can work further on also developing other processes. So what we have here all the time in mind is the cellulose gap. So this actually, everything points out that there is a lack of man-made celluloses. So if you're looking at the megatrends, you have the population increase and you have the prosperity increase. So one of my first slides with this human development index. Um, this is actually pointing at higher fiber demand in the future. We also have the climate change and uh, the need for sustainable solutions, which is also pointing at bio-based fibers and an increase of interest of these. When we're co going into the impact factors, we have the issue with cotton, uh, which preferably should decrease the market share of cotton, or at least stay stable, uh, since we want to use the arable land for other courses, and uh, it's also quite water demanding. So these are the issues. Uh, we have uh, the man-made fibers on the other side. Uh, they are based on wood, which is growing in other areas, so it's not where you can grow crops, for instance, and water use is not an issue, really. Uh, and then something else is the synthetics, so the fossil-based use, which should uh, go down. So this leaves us to the cellulose gaps, which is predicted at 2030. If uh, one prediction is from, uh, um, uh, from Hemerly and in 2011 is that one third of all textile needs to be made of cellulosics. So that includes both cotton and uh, man-made cellulosics. So as cotton cannot grow uh, more on the market share, uh, the only thing remaining is then the man-made cellulosics to grow. So different calculations are, are circulating here, but um, there is, uh, there will most likely be a lack in 2030 of 50 million tons annually man-made cellulosic fibers uh, due to this thinking of the cellulose gap. Uh, and I can also mention that in Sweden, uh, we don't have the production of man-made cellulosics, but we have uh, the starting material, we, we produce the dissolving pulp. But right now, this is below 1 million tons per year. So I think in Sweden, we can also maybe increase that volume. And by this, I will hand over the solos gap to uh, Dr. Josef Innerloinge at Blensing. Thank you. Okay, thank you also. So I'll try to share my screen. So it looks like it works and everyone can see my screen now. And yes, okay, I will start with my presentation now. Um, also already told a lot of things I usually have at the start of my presentation. What is the global situation? Um, what are the different fiber types? Uh, but as a first, a uh, short, so short recap from Arthur's presentation. Uh, you have already seen this picture. It's just a reminder. This is the, let's say, the challenge, the problem we are facing. How is the sustainable development possible? 
because we have limited resources, we just have one planet. Uh, and um, as also said, the goal is to move to this uh, region here to bring the uh, resources usage down, but also to have uh, a better development, a better living conditions for the people. So the goal is to bring most of the people living on this planet today here. And how can this be done? So there's, uh, there's some kind of guidelines. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about this, the Sustainable Development Goals by the United Nations. So this is on a global scale, uh, what can be done, uh, what should be done, uh, to reach this goal, to have a sustainable development for everyone, and of course also to have, now with this climate topic, to reduce this uh, temperature rise, which also also mentioned. So this is, let's say, really a big guideline, uh, which is now used by nations, by companies, uh, to achieve this goal, uh, to have a sustainable development, and also to reduce the impact on the climate. So this is, really on a large scale, uh, how this uh, interferes, how this can be done. Uh, short steer tour, so we also have a similar thing in Austria, it's called the Bioeconomy Strategy, uh, which is also based on this uh, Sustainable Development Goals and on the European strategy. So this uh, strategy in Austria was presented about a year ago, and I mentioned it here because it mentions wood, because like in the Scandinavian countries also has, all, has also a lot of forests. And at the moment, uh, the number one bioresource we have is wood. And we're already using a lot of wood, like the company I'm from Lansing, our raw material is wood. And you say we have quite a huge uh, reserve in, in, in wood, uh, but actually we have still more annual growth that we use. Uh, and of course, we still want to be balanced here. So we don't want to use up this reserve of standing there because you know this is also important for the climate change. Uh, trees are taking up CO2, so we don't want to chop the trees down, but we want to be balanced here, perhaps increase the annual growth so that we have more material available for our bioeconomy here. So this brings me from starting from the global goals from the Austin bioeconomy, brings me to another now to the challenges for the fiber industry. So this, I think, is, includes all the different fiber types. Also mentioned before, the synthetic fibers, cotton, uh, also the mammoth cellulosics. And you see the, cha the, cha uh, the challenges are, of course, climate change, greenhouse gas, water pollution, air pollution. Uh, lack of transparency is becoming more and more a topic uh, because with the consumers becoming more and more aware with these topics about climate change, about uh, also the social impact uh, of the products they're buying. They want to know where the products they're buying are from. And so transparency is becoming a topic. Then already mentioned also the circular economy, recycling on different scales. Then this is also important topic, partly linked to this is waste, microplastics or microfibers for the fiber industry. And then also deforestation is also a big topic, um, perhaps not so much for, for Austria and Scandinavia, but of course globally this is really a topic. Uh, and I will talk about of some of these challenges here, but I think for uh, companies uh, working on the in the bio-based sector, like uh, as a lensing, starting from the raw material wood, these challenges can of course be opportunities. So if we uh, tackle them in the right way. This is a big opportunity also for companies, but also, let's say, for society and also for academia, because I think there's still a lot of things to develop. So I will start with a little bit to go more into detail about this climate change uh, pollution topic. Uh, here is uh, the projected growth of fashion industry till 2030. So perhaps this will get now a little bump due to the corona crisis, but I think the overall picture will stay intact. And of course, the increased demand uh, has also an increased impact. You see also the water consumption rises, energy emissions, uh, CO2. So this all is rising. So and of course, uh, with the first picture, if you keep this in mind, um, topic is how can we have a sustainable development with as less impact on the environment as possible. And 
also we, we are talking about the social impact, also make, uh, making sure the well-being of the people involved here. So this is really one of the challenges uh, we are facing and I think we have some solutions. We At least we have the way where to go, like uh, bio-based uh, energy, uh, still too neutral energy. So this is something where we want to go. So we are on the way here, another picture short, uh, another topic there was, was this deforestation I said, which is not too severe. Perhaps in Europe, of course, talking about Brazil, what happened there last year with the Asian forest. So I think nobody wants that to happen, but from this point of view, the deforestation, I think this is one of the opportunities for Europe, uh, because I guess some of you know, that originally the concept of sustainability comes from forestry. So this is this really old book dated back from, I think it's here, yeah, it's 1713. It was from a uh, German, uh, I think a public servant working for the state. And he was writing this book about how to take care about the forest. And there, for the first time it was mentioned uh, sustainability people should not chop more wood from the uh, from the forest than they replant. So I think in Central and also in Northern Europe, this this concept of sustainability and to take care of the forest, it's, it's really part of, of the yeah, people working in the forest and living from the forest. And of course, this is different in other kinds of the world. And for people outside Europe, it's, it's often hard to understand that also in Europe, we have really strict forest laws and uh, people actually are not allowed to, to chop, just chop down the forest. So they really have to take care about this. And I think this is one of the opportunities we have here in Austria, uh, in Austria also in, in Europe as a whole, so that we can say, okay, our forests, they really manage in a sustainable way, because this is also what uh, the consumers and also the brands want. If they say we have fibers which are made from wood, then we want to make sure that this is a sustainable sourced wood. So I think this is really an opportunity. Another topic, uh, perhaps you don't think about it at the beginning, is this microplastic uh, discussion. I don't know how many about you are aware of this uh, single-use plastic directive by the European Union, which per se is a good thing because it, the aim is to avoid a litter of the oceans with plastic. So uh, some, I think it's about 10 products which are found often in the ocean should be banned. Uh, which is a good thing per se, but uh, the problem is that there's in there is a definition of plastic and what, what is defined as a plastic. And this definition is, yeah, it leaves room for interpretation and uh, it could be interpreted that man-made cellulosic fibers like cellulose or uh, like viscous or lyocell, or even if you're very strict, even talking about cotton or talking about paper and pulp, that these are defined as plastic. So just taking the single plastic directive in, uh, in scope, so this would not be too dramatic, but you know, European legislation as one as one definition is established, it will be used for other parts as well. So this is, this could be a problem. So this is also why we at Lansing and also other, other fire producers are putting a lot of work in there that this definition used in the single use plastic directive uh, is clarified, that it's clear that uh, the materials we are using, so cellulose made from wood, is not a plastic because from my point of view, this would be something that can be a solution to the problem to turn it into, a, uh, into the problem itself, which of course is not uh, correct. So this already brings me back. Now this was a little bit more general picture. Now a few words about Lansing. As I already said, we start from the forest have the wood, so which is sustainable sourced, where we source our own wood because we also have our own pulp mills. We have two pulp mills at the moment, one in Lansing, one in the Czech Republic. Then from the pulp, we're making fibers uh, from the viscous and lyocell process. And there's also a modified viscous process for modal fibers. So we have three different fiber types. And this is the main product we sell the fiber. So we sell them into the textile value chain in the non warrants value chain and then also some special areas let's say it's yeah we call it technical applications like 
this packaging. So we can also use our fibers for packaging. So this is, uh, yeah, during the last years, this is now, let's say, the standard packaging for uh, bio food, for organic food in Austrian supermarkets for fresh foods. So vegetables, uh, fruits, they are packed in nets from, from our fibers. And so this is, we are really at the beginning here, but of course we're working together with all the partners along the textile chain and also the non lawrence chain. So this brings me back to what, what is the business of Mansell at Lansing. I mentioned we start with uh, sustainable forest wood and then uh, let's say the center, the hub of our biorefinery is uh, a pulp factory. And you know about 40% of the wood can be converted to pulp and then onwards to fiber. So this, we are actually a huge pulp, a dissolving pulp producer, but we are using all or most of the pulp ourselves in our different plants around the world to produce uh, the fibers. And the lensing site is fully integrated. So we have the pulp mill and next to it, we have the fiber production. So this means we don't have to uh, dry the pulp. We don't have to package the pulp so it can be easily transported from the pulp to the fire production. So this uh, is a huge advantage, but we are not only producing pulp and then onwards fibers from the uh, wood, we are also producing other biorefined products. This is about another 10% of the raw material wood. So we have 50% uh, material usage and the rest uh, we use to generate energy and heat. So uh, the lensing site nearly is uh, energy self-sufficient from the pipe production. So this is also where we are really, when we look at the energy mix, the energy usage, we are really, let's say, really a green site. And we, at least for the lensing site, we are really in a good way to, to become carbon neutral in a given time. So in this, uh, how we are doing our business and we have been for this with this sustainable develop uh, sustainable developments technology wise and product wise for quite some time and this brought us i think one or one and a half years ago again to to, to sharpen our sustainability strategy uh, and you see there are topics in which we already mentioned the circularity greening the value chain so working really with partners that we have all this partnering for change I think I mentioned this several times because now with the challenges we are facing, uh, this cannot be done by one company alone, especially if you're talking about the circularity. Uh, you, you need partners all along the chain that you can, can build up really a system that works. And also when we talk about uh, greening the chain, yeah, of course you, you need partners who are willing to work with you to really use uh, the material and uh, who are convinced that this is the right way to go forward. So, this naturally positive uh, sustainable strategy of ours. So this really combines and brings in a lot of different partners uh, from, from all different fields. So this is was more on the, the general side, what we want to do and, what, what, and how we want to contribute. And now to, a, let's say, a really concrete example already mentioned by Elsa about the circle economy. We have now, since 2017, uh, a fiber type on the market, the lyocell fiber, which is not mainly from 100% from wood pulp, uh, but it has a certain percentage of recycled cotton in there. So at the moment we are at 30% recycled cotton. So usually you see you would have wood, wood chips and have the pulp and from the pulp you would make the fibers and then the textiles. And for this refiber technology, we are using also cotton textiles. So the standard at the moment is we are using uh, cutting swaps from textile production. So this is what we call post-industrial waste. So this is a rather well-defined material, uh, but still it was quite a challenge uh, to use this cotton to make a pulp which is suitable for fiber production because here uh, we did not compromise on the quality. So this uh, refiber fiber has the same quality, the same properties as a fiber made 100% uh, from wood pulp. So, but this is now since 2017, it's commercially available. We have been the first one to really to commercialize uh, a man made cellulosic fiber with recycled content. Uh, now we are also working on, of course, to use post consumer waste. 
also really what after the wearing cycle when people handing in their textiles to some collections so that we can again make uh, pulp and fibers out of this so we already have the, had the first successful production on industrial scale not just talking about pilot scale but really on a production facility last year so and we are really moving forward and so the goal is to move up to 50% in the next years of recycled content and of course to increase uh, the content of uh, post-consumer waste so that we really can collect uh, the text from the people after use and reuse them and I guess this, when you look at your text as usually it's not just pure cotton it's usually it's mixtures so you have to separate cotton and usually it's polyester and, and this is quite a challenge and then of course brings me back to the partnering part topic I was talking about best thing would you have somebody you can use the polyester or at least uh, let's say the also have you always have the possibility to make energy out of it uh, but this is quite challenging and of course I know Lansing is not working alone on this topic there are a lot of uh, companies and institutes all around the world especially also in Scandinavia I think Scandinavia is really a leading uh, region here with, with new developments about this recycling so and uh, we are also partnering up here with also in, in the context of uh, European projects to develop this further because uh, this is something you cannot uh, do alone so you need you really need a partner so this is really this refibro topic and uh, just, just mention of course we can again recycle the, the, the refibro fibers or any lyocell fiber again so if if there's more of this fiber on the market it's also recyclable so we really can close the loop so on a larger scale so but nevertheless i think we will need still virgin material in the future uh, because as you know during uh, usage cellulose is degraded the chain is shortened so to have the, the quality you need uh, you still need some virgin material. So I think 100% uh, uh, recycling, of course, would be a nice thing. Uh, but that for sure is a long way to go. So at the moment, uh, I think for the next couple of years or decades, we will still need some virgin material here. But of course, we want to increase the content of recycled material. So this is one of, of the, let's say, of the loops the circularity we have at Lansing uh, but we're also talking about circularity on different levels so what I was mentioning here was this refibro either using from post-industrial waste or post-consumer waste uh, but we have also and this is this recycled claim so that we will have to do recycling on let's say in a technological level and when we are talking about cellulose which is a natural material we always also talk about this larger cycle let's say on sometimes we call it on a recycling on a biological level because cellulose fibers can be composted they are degraded uh, they can be converted to soil again and at least they're not harmful in the environment and what's again coming back to this uh, microplastic discussion in the ocean is also important that this material can be also degraded in uh, aquatic and also uh, under marine conditions so this is also important and when when showing this picture and often afterwards in discussions then because it also states you can compost this then people ask me do you want me to throw my t-shirt or, or my trousers on the compost and you said of course not we should bring it back to recycling you should use it but uh, you should also be aware that when when you're wearing your text, when you're washing it, it, it releases fibers that they are released in the environment. And then we think it's beneficial that these fibers which are released, that they can be degraded um, in environment so that they don't stay there and don't cause problems. And of course, there are some also some applications uh, where it's very likely uh, that the material will get lost. So I was showing briefly this, this industrial applications at the beginning uh, what my colleagues are also working on is a, is a twines for growing vegetables because it's really hard uh, in the greenhouse uh, to separate uh, at the end of the season uh, the twine where the 
the plants were growing from from the plants. So and if this can if the twine can be composted with the plants, there's a big advantage. And usually it's really hard to separate this. So and if this twine is from a synthetic material, you bring some synthetic material again to the environment. So I think the applications where it really makes sense that the material is compostable, uh, but of course this does not indicate that you should throw your t-shirt, uh, your your trousers to the compost or so. Of course, you if you want, you could do it. So I think this was also mentioned uh, before uh, that of course uh, there is a need for more environmental friendly products, fibers. But of course, people are always more and more they're really wanting a proof. So a nice story is good, but the story is not enough. People start to ask what's behind this. And also already mentioned this life cycle thinking, this life cycle assessment. And uh, here Lansing really was one of the first, I think it was the first fiber company to have a life cycle assessment of our fibers, uh, which went into this uh, Higgs index, this MSI score. Uh, which is used by the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. So this now is just a breakdown of a lot of, of factors uh, affecting the environment, which comes from the production, which comes from the raw material, energy usage. Uh, there's a lot of this in there. So this is summing up in one number and the lower the score, the better. Uh, so now I'm, it's just a comparison of, of, let's say for generic lyocell fiber, generic viscous fiber, the average fiber of tensile IO cells, so some plants are even better than the average here in Lansing, and Lansing Ecovero, which is our, let's say, our flex zip about uh, the, let's say, most sustainable viscous uh, available. So this is also, you see that the, the impact on the environment is, is really low compared to other, also the generic man-made cellulosic fiber. And it's not here on this slide, but it's, also lower than, let's say, cotton or polyester. So this is taking this into account, this uh, global warming potential, also the water usage. So these uh, fibers, they're really a good option, especially taken into account if they can be recycled, uh, like just mentioned before. And yeah, this again, uh, I think this <laughs> brings me back to some, some points I already mentioned. So this is already a bit of sum up. We cannot do this alone. So we as Lansing can do this alone. I don't think that any company can do this alone. So we really cooperate now. During the last years, we really intensified our cooperation in this field. Uh, because as I said, we are, we are the fiber producer. We are really at the beginning of the, of the production chain. Uh, so we really need the partners along the, the whole value chain. But we need also partners like NGOs, uh, also partners like the government. This is like, I said Lansing was also involved when, when this Austrian uh, bioeconomy strategy was developing, so we were also in the advising group. So this is also, we really try to, say the, to, try to see the big picture. So this is uh, all, all people in, in the, the, the value chain down to the really to the final customer in the shop who's buying uh, products made from our fibers. I mentioned which is important to have a transparency. So we have also a transparency system for our fibers so that they can be identified that these fibers are really from sustainable production starting from the wood, the fiber production itself down to the whole textile chain. So we have an identification system both on a physical and a an, uh, virtual level. So using a blockchain technology. So this is really important to work together here uh, because it's with the challenges we are facing, it's, it's, it's really too, I think too, too much that one, one company alone can do. So it's important to cooperate here. This also includes, I think this is not on this slide, so, but this also of course includes cooperation with academia, with universities, to be aware of new developments, to bring in new ideas. So there's at the moment, there's a lot of going on and I think with, with the challenges we are facing, of course the, the textile industry cannot solve the problem alone. But I think we, we really can contribute uh, to make the world a better place. And I think this is one also, this has also changed in the last year that this is also now the strategy and this is becoming more and more uh, a common goal within Lansing that 
with what we are doing, of course, we want to earn money, but that's the basic uh, in principle. What we want to do, we want to deliver materials with as less impact to environment, so which makes the world a better place, so to say. Okay, so this was summing up. So again, highlighting from also from my personal view, which is really important. Uh, to have this cooperation and not to be the, the, let's say, the lone wolf, because I think we need all, everything here. We already need the established companies we can, which can deliver already solutions at a large scale, but we need also startups, universities with new ideas, which will develop over the next few years and decades. So that was it from my side. Uh, thank you very much for being here at the seminar, this online seminar. So it was also for me, it was a new experience to have a seminar this way. Also, I'm in home office since one week and having a lot of, um, lot of WebEx meetings, but the seminar was really new. And just the last slide, so also I'm in home office. This is the region I'm working, this is the Lansing factory. So it's a nice rural region. So uh, there are worse places to work. And I think there are also worse places to be at home for some weeks and work from home. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, Josef, and, and this looks nice. Uh, calls for a visit, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and thank you also, Olsa, for, for your presentation. Now, we are running a little bit late, uh, but I hope that, uh, that everyone can stay a bit because we have quite a few questions. Uh, so let me see if I can get them. And I will take them in order. So I will take the first question first, if I can get to that. Um, Finn uh, asked here if, uh, if um, and I, I think this is a question for, for you, Josef, um, the very different cross-sections of viscous and Leo cell fibers indicate quite different dyeing properties, reactive dyes versus Morton dyes. Uh, how is that? Uh, yeah, okay. I'm not really an expert in dyeing, but, but yes, that, that's true. And we also we have, a, let's say, a, our own department really working on this, this dyeing properties. And this also said that we are working with the whole chain and down the whole textile chain. So really uh, developing dyeing recipes for special fibers and, and also with the mixture, as I said, you usually have a mixture and then you, you need different... Uh, Dying techniques, yeah. This this is one thing. You really have to be careful what 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 dye you are using. Uh, and another thing is, uh, let's say that's that's again more in our hands that we are also let's say um, modifying the fiber in a way that it has a higher dye uptake, especially for the for the viscose and and, and uh, modal fibers. It's the dye uptake sometimes is, is is let's say not too good. And of course, this is has a negative impact because you know. We use a lot of dye in the dye bars, uh, so the, we have some. I think yeah, we have some fibers in development which have a higher dye uptake, but also for lyocell where we try to, to to modify the fiber surface, the fiber chemistry a bit, so that there is a better dye uptake. Yeah, but that's something you for sure have to take into account. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'll move on with the next question here. It's like a big black hole. We'll we'll see what, <laughs> what happens here. <laughs> Uh, uh, but um, Michael has, has asked, uh, what about other waste streams uh, uh, with uh, for for you know cellulose sources like uh, bamboo straws, biomass, or or something like that? Have you considered that? Are you using uh, that? Yeah, yeah, we 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 have been considering that, and we have been looking into that for for quite some time. Uh, it's of course also a bit the, the availability of this, these materials. Um, and I think we also have, let's say, also in Lancet changed our mindset a little bit um, because we are used to think in, in 10,000 of tons and we want if, if something runs, we want to also to be able to use this to, uh, on, on the large industrial scale. And, and this is really tricky with these materials because the, the quality is a bit, uh, not too stable, but now we are again really re-relating many of these things on, the, on a pilot scale. We said perhaps it's interesting to have at least small patches and we here we already talk, when we are talking about small patches, it's still several tens of tons which we can do on the pilot plant. So we are now really re-relating these alternative resources. Um, 
yeah, but it's of course about the okay. uh, availability and let's say at the moment from the calculations and the data we have, the most economic and also ecologic feasible still is wood if it's from a sustainable uh, forest. Okay. But we are working on this, especially on this, this waste stream. So the, I think there's a big potential there. Great, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the next question. Um, I don't know whether this is a big question, but can you tell more about the pulp pretreatment before cold dis dissolution? Um, and I, I don't know whether this is for Osa or for, for Josef, but... Uh, also it's, it's for you, I guess, yeah. Yes. Uh, for, more about the pulp pretreatment. Uh, actually, this is... So cold alkali dissolution is a um, direct dissolution media which means that as well as for, for lyosal, the pretreatment is quite important. So this is where you actually are adapting the pulp to fit the dissolution. And uh, my experience in the lab on this is that if you're changing the pulp just a bit, uh, you actually have to change also or also adapt the procedure for um, the dissolution. So you're, you're changing your temperature uh, scheme or your um, yeah, uh, stirring time or whatever it could be. So it's very dependent on how you pretreat your, your uh, pulp. But you can pretreat it by uh, chemically mechan and mechanically and somatically. Uh, you can, you can pretreat it in several ways. Um, and it's causing higher, it should cause higher accessibility and higher um, uh, and, and lower degree of polymerization. So lower cellulose chains. Great, thank, thank you, Wasa. I, I think uh, what we're going to do after this seminar is actually to, to uh, send out a mail to everybody who's been participating so that, uh, you know, deeper explanations can maybe be posed to you. Uh, afterwards as well. Sure. Um, anyway, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm moving on here um, uh, and saying that um, uh, one question from Matthias here is, is um, approximately 25 million tons of cotton is produced per year. What share do you think is realistic to turn into man-made cellulose, cellulosic fibers per year? Uh, you mentioned the figure there was up today, but um, I suppose this is for the future. Uh, mm. how, how much do you think it would be expanding and how fast? Uh, well, it, it's up to Lansing how fast it will be expanding, <laughs> but there, there are some challenges, uh, of course. Today, we don't, we're not even collecting post-consumer waste in that way. So uh, we, we need also to have uh, collection and sorting facilities in place. Uh, we need to have pure fractions of cotton waste. So today this is taken from the, the industrial laundries where you can actually have pure cotton or pure polyester cotton streams so you know what kind of chemical load you should put on them uh, when you convert them into a dissolving pulp. So I can't really say a number on this uh, because it also depends on, on how society develops in, in the collection infrastructure. So the, the, the potential, you both say that the potential is great, but there are some challenges as well, right? Sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, we have one question from Anavi Berry here saying that, can you re recirculate tensile with refibra process? Uh, did you mention that, Joseph? Yeah, yes, we, we, we can do it. We have also done the trials. You can use uh, tensile fibers, also viscous fibers. So the cellulose two type fibers, you can also use them for the refiber process. So we did this trial. So also, again, looking into the future, if more and more of this material hopefully becomes available, uh, that be, can be uh, brought into really a, a closed loop so that you have several loops and not just one loop and then you have to dispose it anyhow. Now it is possible to have it several times in the loop, uh, but as mentioned, I think you will need some virgin material because uh, the fiber length uh, is, is, is short and it's degrading. So to have the quality, you need some virgin material, but in principle, you can recycle it several times. Also, you can 
again recycled every fibra. So this is this is again possible. So th there's another question on that, saying that uh, can you mention the challenges to use post-consumer cotton textiles in the refibra technology? And also, I suppose uh, another question related to that is is how difficult is it to bleach any type of colored cotton textiles in that recycling process? Mm, okay, that's, I think that's uh, the reason why we started this is post-industrial, which is not colored. So we have a uh, relatively well-defined material, uh, but what we do, uh, let's say one, one, one thing is the depleting, but this is, and you know, there are a lot of textile dyes and color and so on, so this, uh, you have something, you have to find something that works for most of them, uh, but this is done, let's say, where in modified pulping process, this works relatively well. Uh, the more challenge is to separate the different fibers, usually because you have mixed textiles, you have different fibers in, and what already also works quite good is to separate uh, the cellulose part from the polyester part. Uh, one of the main challenges at the moment, uh, you know that many textiles, there's a small fraction of uh, elastane of spandex in there, and it's hard to get rid of that. So this is, at the moment, this is a big challenge. Uh, so, so yeah. what is the production capacity of refibra? That that's another question. But, oh. Maria Strom. Oh, that, that, that's a good, good question. I think at the moment we are mainly limited um, by by the, the pulping step. Uh, but I think it, it, it should be. I think uh, I'm sure we can produce if it's enough pulp several thousand tons per year. So I, I think we can ramp it up because it was is already proven at large scale. So I think at the moment the bottleneck is not so much the fiber production. It's more the sorting, collecting, and to to have to turn the the cotton uh, the cotton wax into pulp. So this is more at the moment the uh, the main bottleneck. I suppose that there's another there's another issue here that that's uh, on the top of my mind as well. Um, how to sep separate the various types of fibers in cotton textile because most of it is is nowadays um, mixed with synthetic fibers. Is that a challenge too? Yeah, this is, as I said, we, we, we also have already partners along the chain here, you know, there are textile sorters for the recycling, so that we really get uh, textiles with, an, let's say, as much uh, high cotton content as possible, uh, but uh, you already can separate cotton and polyester, that's possible, so that, that's something you can do also in the treatment, but the better it's sorted at the beginning, uh, of course, the more efficient is the process afterwards. Uh, but of course, it's difficult to get really pure, uh, uh, as pure as much uh, cotton from post uh, consumer, because there's, as you mentioned, there's a lot of mixed textiles. So we're also developing a process that it can be separated in the process. But of course, this is let's say that the whole process has to be optimized. So what's what's the maximum amount that you can bring into a process? And that's also still uh, possible to separate at the con uh, at the sorter. So this is something which which has to optimize along the whole value chain. Okay. Now, some of these questions are, are so big that I think <laughs> they're difficult to, to uh, get online. And I really would like to get your, your impact on, on menti.com as well. So um, I'm... Um, uh, kind of uh, wanting to draw a line here um, uh, to be able to to ask you all uh, to contribute to our, our uh, menti.com uh, and I would urge uh, I know that some of you didn't get, uh, get didn't get answer to your questions um, I would urge you to to uh, to contact these experts later on with all your questions because there's so many of them um, uh, I hope everybody, as this is a black hole, nobody's saying anything, so I suppose it's okay. <laughs> um, once again, I'd like to thank...